Uh, I needed to try it or I, I knew in that moment if I didn't I would regret that the rest of my life. Always wondering could I uh, become an artist? Could I paint at the level I envisioned in my head, the, at the level that I was seeing in this gallery? Hello, my name is Scott Ruthven and I'm an artist. In fact, I'm about to start work on this painting behind me. But as I do, I thought I would take a minute to share some of my observations on how the process to create a painting, a good painting, very similar to the process to creating a good life. Now, I don't have everything figured out. I'm a work in progress. But I do have some observations that really help me out, and I wish my 18-year-old self or my 40-year-old self would have heard them. So if fear and doubt are in your way, listen to my story. I believe we are all best when doing the work we are called to do, but it takes faith to follow that. And the sooner we summon that faith, the more joy we can bring ourselves and the world. As I think about my life and the path that I've taken so far, there were two decision points, one when I was 19 years old and another when I was 40, that had broad implications for my happiness and how I could contribute my gifts to the world. I remember winning a poster design contest when I was in the third or the fourth grade. The prize was I got to ride atop a shiny red fire engine in our local parade. It was a blue sky, warm sunshine day, and I was literally on cloud nine. I will never forget being perched on top of that fire engine, looking down over the crowd. Everybody was having a great day, and I thought right then and there, art was my superpower. I went on to win some other contests and awards as I went through school, and naturally thought, I'll go to art school and become an artist. But my parents, they divorced when I was two, and I was raised by my single mother. Money was very tight. In fact, it was difficult to keep food on the table and a roof over our head. So the idea of going to college really was never a discussion topic. There wasn't money set aside for college, and neither of my parents had gone, so I really had no resource or idea about college at that point in my life. Now, my high school art teachers, art and photography teachers, were very supportive of me. Uh, in fact, they gave me free reign to the classrooms, all the supplies, the photo lab, um, dark room. It was amazing. But when I got to my senior year and it was time to apply to colleges, I realized I didn't even have enough money to apply. Alas, my guidance counselor helped me and I made one application, just one, but it was to my local state college, Colorado State University, and I was accepted. I was given some grant money and access to a lot of student loans to cover the difference. This was far from what I had dreamed about, but way in excess of what I ever thought was possible. Now, just as a masterful painting doesn't happen by accident, neither does life. You have to design your life with intention. Well, when I was 18, I had no concept of what my life looked like. I just thought my skills and my interests would land me a dream job working for Disney or whoever, right? I worked at off-campus jobs all through college just to minimize the amount of loans that I had to take. But I was keenly aware of the amount of debt I was getting into, and I really wanted a return on my investment. So one day, uh, my second year, I went to the career counseling office to inquire about jobs in the fine art field, visual art field specifically, and the salary ranges I might expect. To my horror, they were absolutely no help. They had no salary range data, and in fact, said really, there was no guarantee of any job. As I know today, there's really no guarantees of jobs. But specifically in the fine art field, uh, they could not pin down jobs that I could get into with the, the course of study that I was taking. And in fact, they said uh, I would likely have to be a freelance artist tracking down job by job, customer by customer. And as such, I would probably benefit from getting some business courses. Well, that seemed logical, but honestly, I was crushed. So I asked them if they had salary data for any other areas uh, or other fields that I might go into to which they handed me a barely legible photocopy. Of course, this was a few years back, but on it they had some broadly classified careers, such as forestry, business, science, um, and engineering. Each one of those had a salary range that was huge. I mean, from literally $15,000 to $150,000, so it could have been anything, right? But I did notice quickly that business and engineering had the highest upside potential. Now, I'm not really into math, so that ruled out engineering. But I thought it made sense to go ahead and sign up for some business classes, and that's what I did. Long story short, that was a pivotal moment where I began to trade my passion for money. I own that decision. 
and I understand it. I was searching for security that I really never had in my life. But my advice to anybody in the same situation, if I could talk to my 18 year old self or maybe you're in this situation today, is follow your passion. Even if the money isn't gonna look so good, don't abandon it so quickly. Really go after it and there's things that you can do to help be successful. Now we all have to be productive members of society and earn our keep, I believe. But that doesn't mean you have to trade your um, creative passion, what you're called to do, the thing that stirs your soul. Follow that. Things you can do like keeping your expenses down, avoiding debt, saving even a little bit of everything you earn and investing that. So at some point in your life, that grows to a huge amount of money. These are all things that can help separate the need for money with following your passion and allow you to make better decisions about jobs that you take, opportunities that you pursue. You don't do so just uh, searching for the money, but you follow something that is your calling. Now, if you don't know what you're called to do, listen patiently and trust your gut. That answer is within inside of you. It's in all of us. I can't stress enough how important it is to listen deeply to what stirs your soul, as that is so easily drowned out by the noise of the expectations of others. Denying who you are comes at too high a price. I vividly remember the months I spent that year in college agonizing over what I should do with my life. Should I go the route of art, pursue my passion, my calling, or should I go the route of business and pursue money? I wasn't even sure if I changed my major that I'd have enough money to complete my degree because all of the courses I had taken were art related and really stacked up to little more than electives at this point. By the end of that semester, I made my decision and I committed to it. And it took me on a wild ride for the next 21 years. Now let me show you something. I'll step back so it's in frame. You see this little painting? Well, it's my roadmap for painting this larger piece behind me. By working out the details of my vision on a small scale, I can make um, all the corrections I need to and really have confidence that my vision is something I can execute on the larger canvas. It's like a roadmap, so to speak. Now, if I didn't have a roadmap and I just started painting, the likelihood of me ending up with a, a nice painting uh, is pretty slim. And it's the same way in life. If we set out in our life and we don't really have a plan of where we're gonna go, we're almost assured to not get there, right? Because you wouldn't even recognize arriving at the life, your dream life, let's say, if you didn't have a view or a vision of what that looked like. The more good decisions we make that are lined up with us getting to that end point of view that we desire, the more likely we are to actually achieve it. Fast forward a few weeks and the painting's done. It came out the way I wanted to. Uh, it was a lot of work, but I probably couldn't have gotten to this end result without that little study that I had started with. Remember, my roadmap. So anyway, back to the story. If you remember, I was in my junior year of college and I was faced with the decision of, do I continue on taking classes in art and become a, an artist or do I switch to business administration or engineering? Well, I decided to switch my major officially to business administration. And I was happy about that because I had made a decision now I could move forward a little bit. Um, however, I only had a short amount of time left in college and I needed to graduate on time because I was racking up debt. Uh, I was working at the same time and I just needed to get it done so I could get into a job and start making money. Um, those last two years then, a year and a half or so, uh, I ended up taking 15 to 18 credit hours. I was working a, uh, what was called the B shift out at Kodak, 3.30 to midnight, three or four nights a week. And uh, that really squeezed out all available time for making art. So it was at that point in my life that I really stopped making art, stopped creating, and focused solely on getting that degree. The second half of my senior year then, I began to apply with companies and accepted an offer with Hewlett Packard. And my job actually started the Monday following my graduation. So I had a two day break between college and going to work full time. Uh, here I was, freshly minted business school graduate working for the most admired tech company in the world at the time. And I was thrilled. I, you know, I was really proud of myself and what I had accomplished. And I thought I was on uh, you know, the right track. So I spent the next 15 years climbing the corporate ladder, 
trying to pursue that uh, American dream that we're told about. And I had great success. I'm still having success in that. But, um, you know, I, I became a, a manager, moved up through the ranks, and was given more and more responsibility, had pay raises. All of that felt great. Um, I've managed teams of 30 people plus around the world on products generating hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue a year. So I've learned a lot, have a lot of success there, but I had this void still in me that um, I didn't think I should have. I was on the, you know, the gold standard of routes for pursuing the American dream um, according to our society. And I was earning ahead of uh, other people my age at the time and uh, just doing really well. So why was I, you know, still feeling something was missing? During those years, we started to have kids and um, I started to think about my legacy and what would my legacy be working in a job, corporate America, and um, continuing on this path. Now, it's not a bad path by any means, but uh, in a company, your quarterly results, your monthly results, releasing a product on time, those become paramount and you get sucked into that too and you think that that's the most important thing in the world, you know, whatever it takes, you know, 12 hour plus days working on that project. When you see the finish line, then you'll take a break. But at the end of the day or the end of my life, I was worried that um, who cares about those things, right? Is anybody going to say, oh man, Scott Ruthven, he met his quarterly objectives quarter after quarter after quarter. It just doesn't work that way. So what would be my legacy? In fact, as my kids got older, they didn't really even understand what I did. Uh, most people don't understand all the different jobs in corporate America. So what was it all for? Just to earn money, to buy the American dream? And I'm starting to think, what is this American dream? Is it my dream? Not so much. Uh, elements are, yes, but other elements are not. Then one day when I was 40 years old, my wife Lisa and I were down in Denver, Colorado. And we decided to stop into an art gallery, a well-established, beautiful gallery down in Denver, and just see what the artwork was that they were hanging or the show that they had on the wall. I'll tell you, the minute, I mean, the second that I walked in that building, I still remember opening those doors and I could feel, you know, the cool air of the gallery. It was in the summertime and the smell of linseed oil, a little bit of turpentine and that beautiful art. And I instantly, every cell in my body started to scream, this is what you're supposed to be doing. And I was overwhelmed, uh, frankly. I, I, uh, I wasn't expecting that emotion. I was just down in Denver for the day. We thought we'd pop in. And all of a sudden, this wave, a tsunami of, of feelings about what I should be doing, and um, memories of, you know, kind of this thing in me that uh, I cherish but had abandoned recklessly for years now at this point. And um, so I kept my composure. I didn't say anything to my wife for a little bit. We looked at some art, kept uh, checking out paintings. And then I finally just turned to her and I said, Honey, I think I can paint at this level. And if I don't try, I'll regret it the rest of my life. Now this was kind of a statement and a question at the same time. Um, it was a statement I felt I had to make to myself. I, you know, I had kind of no control at that point to say an affirmation that this is who I was and was meant to do. And uh, I needed to try it or I, I knew in that moment if I didn't, I would regret that the rest of my life. I was wondering, could I uh, become an artist? Could I paint at the level I envisioned in my head, the, at the level that I was seeing in this gallery of beautiful work? And also maybe a way to question to my wife uh, or pose the question that, hey, would this even be possible in our dynamic of our family and the things that we've got going on with uh, the career and the kids and, and life in general? We were very busy at that time. Now, mind you, I was 40 with the wife, four kids at that time, and um, I wasn't really in a position to just quit my day job and become an artist. But I did make a commitment that day to get back into art uh, and make steps into learning a craft, um, learning the craft, and fulfilling what I thought was my destiny. So I began to learn about oil painting. I had painted before a little bit in oils, but mostly acrylic, watercolor, did drawing and stuff. But I had this penchant to try oils. So 
I began learning everything I could about oil painting and the materials and practicing and began painting on uh, weekends and at night whenever I could get a little block of time to go and work on the craft. Now what I learned was that I had a tendency to spend all of my free time um, researching, reading, looking at uh, great art and doing everything except actually creating art. I kind of run myself out of time uh, just before I was ready to create. And I realized I was procrastinating. I had this performance anxiety that, uh, gosh, I think I've got this in me. I've declared I'm going to start doing it. Uh, what if I fail? Um, but luckily, once I addressed that, once I realized it, then, um, you know, I just made a plan of action to get in there and do the work. Now, a key to that was actually having some studio space, an area where my materials were set up and I could come out and paint at any given time and not have to worry about getting paints out and brushes and setting all this stuff up because that's a lot of work. And sometimes you just have a little time and a little creative energy and that can zap it from you. So once I got a space together where I could have everything out and when I was ready to come and work, I could begin work right away. It made a big difference. Now, after a while of painting and I, I started to get confidence with oils, then I took my studio outdoors and painted from life. And that made a big difference in my personal growth and understanding of uh, how to paint light on different subjects. And that led to me signing up for plein air uh, competitions. And over time, I've participated in many, many of those. Yeah, the rigors of painting in a plein air competition uh, over a week period or three or four day period, um, the rigors there really elevated my skills and took me from an amateur to a professional. I had to find, you know, you don't wait for inspiration, you go find inspiration, you get out there and you paint and you create and you're having to create uh, paintings that are worthy of a frame and a sale. And that took my work and my work ethic up um, substantially. Now, as I'm making this video, I'm just a few weeks away from my 50th birthday. And now nearly 10 years into this experience of painting, uh, I paint full time, but I also still work full time. That has afforded me the opportunity to grow my skills at the level that I want, the absolute peak with no sacrifices, because I don't have to worry about selling a painting to pay my bills, right? And that's a real luxury. So it's a trade-off, but it's also a luxury. Now, I won't work forever. I will retire into painting full-time. That's kind of funny to say, because I don't think you really ever retire from being a creative person. And I want to paint the rest of my life. God willing, however long I can paint and see and, and actually execute a painting, I will continue to learn and improve my craft and, and my paintings. So that's a real gift, and I can't wait to continue to do that the rest of my life. Not something I think I would retire from, right? This past 10 years have brought so many gifts into my life. Um, so let me talk about the collectors. I'm so touched by the wonderful collectors that I've, I've uh, gotten over the years. I have paintings um, in many collections, but it's really about the relationships that I, I develop with these collectors. They're like-minded people, and they tell me such touching stories about how they connect with the art. And it's frankly amazing. Uh, I paint something because I connect to that scene. And they buy it and collect it because they love that scene and the way I've handled it and interpreted it. So we've got this instant bond that is really unlike anything else I've ever experienced. I'll tell you a story, in fact. Um, when I paint in plein air events, oftentimes I'll paint in a location that has a lot of foot traffic by it. Let's say a national park. And um, when I'm in the national park painting, for every 10 people that go by, maybe one or two will stop and talk about the art, ask what I'm doing, and really be uh, interested in what's going on. Well, I used to worry about the nine that passed, right, and didn't care, and didn't seem to want to stop. You know, why weren't they interested? But I soon learned that you don't need to worry about those, and this is true in life, right? Don't worry about the nine that pass by. Worry about the one that stops. The one that stops, that's the relationship you can cultivate. There's a connection there already. The other nine are just different people, but they're maybe not part of your tribe. They're not of the same mindset, and they're not interested in that. Let them keep walking. They're for perfectly fine people. Nothing wrong with that. But don't put energy wondering uh, how, how you make them fans, right? Focus on that one that does stop, and uh, that's where you really build a, a relationship and a bond that will last. Once I became uh, my authentic self and was not afraid or had the courage to 
be an artist and let people know I'm an artist, not just paint in the basement at night. Um, I started to attract and draw in other like-minded people that were there all along, but uh, we kind of found each other. And the relationships I have with my artist friends are um, so wonderful. They've added so much to my life, and I'm so blessed to have that. Uh, they truly are, um, you know, we, we share a bond and a language that uh, is unique. And that, those experiences and relationships have, have changed my life for the better. So after 10 years, I can truly say that today, I'm creating work I'm proud of. Work that's meaningful and work that'll be my legacy. Really, I can look back on this and my kids and my grandkids will see the work that I did during my time here. And I think that'll count for something. And now, while the last chapter in my life hasn't been written yet, and I hope it won't be written for many, many years to come, there are a few things here that I'll just share with you that I know for sure and I've learned in these 10 years that made all the difference for me and I want to share with you no matter where you're at in your journey. So the first one is honor who you are and cultivate the gifts that you've been given. You know, in our society today, when we teach a kid through school, we put a little more emphasis on the, on the subjects or, or study areas that they're not doing so well in. Try to get them to do better, better, better in the areas that they're deficient. That's good to a point, but I see it sometimes to the, almost to the exclusion of uh, the things that they're really good at because they're taken for granted. But really, uh, I think each of us is unique and we're put here for a, a reason, a very specific reason. So understand what that reason is for you. Honor that and really cultivate the gifts that you've been given because you can maximize what your impact is in this world if you focus on the things that you love and you're naturally good at. Expand on those, grow those. The second thing I wanna share with you is to keep your overhead low and your options wide open so that you can pursue whatever your heart desires. Now, this applies to anybody, but maybe more in particular at the beginning of your career. When you're young, don't take on debt. Don't take on um, more expenses in your life than, than you can cover comfortably. Instead, build a lifestyle that you can support with the thing that you love to do. So, um, you know, if it's being an artist or photographer or whatever, a dancer, anything like that, make sure that the lifestyle you're signing up for, the commitments you're making financially, don't um, overreach your capability of earnings in the field that you really wanna be in. I think you'll be much happier. And that leads me to the third point, which is money can put food on your table, but it won't feed your soul. So the pursuit of money solely still leaves you with a void. As I talked about, I felt that void. Although I had all the material successes, it wasn't uh, the full picture there. So money has its place. We all need it, but you need to do something that's going to feed your soul. That's how you're going to be able to plug away at whatever it is for a lifetime. And finally, it's never too late. No matter where you are in your life, I was 40 when I made that decision to get back into art. It's never too late to come back and do the thing that you feel inside is what you need to be doing. Don't forget about that thing. Don't lose that thing. Reconnect with it and the sooner the better because we're never guaranteed tomorrow. So if there's something that's bugging you, you know you should do and you think I'll do it when I retire, boy, don't do it. Do it right now. And it doesn't have to be that you jump ship and go you know, both feet full time into something new, take a baby step. So it's like this painting behind me. It was a lot of work, right? I didn't come and paint this in an afternoon. What I did is I had my roadmap, the little painting that was the, uh, the test of what I wanted to do. Then I came out each and every day and I painted a little bit with that vision in mind of where I wanted this big painting to end up. But I made a little progress every single day, painting section after section. And the painting that I did was all lined up to get to that end goal. So it was in the right direction. Life is the same way. If you can make baby steps in the right direction every day, you'll get there eventually and you'll enjoy the ride. Have patience and work continuously toward the things that, that you want in your life. So with that, let me leave you with a quote from Henry David Thoreau. It's one of my favorites. Go confidently in the direction of your dreams. Live the life you've imagined. I wish you all well and thank you.